Our subject is entitled Suratul Kaf and the Modern Age. The companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam were sitting, talking amongst themselves. When he, the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam, came and asked, What are you talking about? And they said, we are talking about alamatu sa'a, the signs of the last day. And he replied, and this hadith is in Sahih Muslim, the last day would not come until, and he mentioned ten signs. But they were not given in the order or the chronological sequence in which they will occur. Now, let us very quickly recall those ten. Number one, Dajjal, the false messiah, because he is known as al Masihud Dajjal, the one who will seek to impersonate the true messiah, Nabi Isa alayhi salam. Number two, Gog and Magog, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, who were human beings from Banu Adam. Number three, the return of the son of Mary. Number four, Dukhan, smoke. Number five, Dabbatul Aq, a beast or a creature of the land, of the earth. Number six, that the sun would rise from the west. Number seven, eight and nine, three earthquakes, which would result in sinking down of the earth. One in the east, one in the west, and the third in Arabia. And number ten, that a fire will come out of Yemen and drive people to their place of assembly, which is Arafat. Suratul Kaf of the Quran has the unique distinction of being the only surah of the Quran linked by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam himself with Dajjal. The Prophet said sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam recite the first ten ayat of Suratul Kahf over Dajjal and you will be safe from his fitna. And in another hadith, the last ten. And so this hadith, sorry, this surah is directly linked with Dajjal. Nothing else in the Quran is linked to Dajjal with hadith. But this surah has a second unique distinction that it is in this surah of the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the explanation of the subject of Gog and Magog, Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So if there is a branch of knowledge known as Ilmu Akhilul Zaman or Islamic eschatology, this surah of the Quran is Paraksinas, the surah of Ilmu Akhiru Zaman or eschatology. We have a limited amount of time tonight, and therefore you have homework to do. The pagan Arabs of Arabia did not know how to assess the claim of one who was born and who lived amongst them. 
and who had so impressed them that they called him Al Amin, the trustworthy. He should make the claim that he is a prophet, like unto Ibrahim alayhi salam, like unto their father Ismail alayhi salam, because all the Arabs knew that they were descended from Ismail alayhi salam. But who said that you must worship only one God, and God is not an idol <laughs> in a temple. So they decided to send a delegation to that city in the north, which is known as Yathrib, and now it's known as Medina, to inquire, get help. Because in that city, strangely, the cream of the Jewish ulama were assembled. In French they say, la crème de la crème, <laughs> the best of the Jewish ulama. Excuse me, Rabbi, what are you doing here? <laughs> Why are you here? That's a very interesting subject. So the delegation met with the rabbis, and the rabbi said, ask him these three questions, which only a prophet can answer. And you'll have to do the homework to find out what were the questions. We don't have time for that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the answers to the three questions. And two of the answers are located in Surah al kaf of the Quran. Two of them. Knowledge which only a prophet would have. And that is communicated to us in Surah al kaf of the Quran. The third answer was placed by divine instructions in the preceding surah, Surah Al-Isra, which is also sometimes known as Surah Bani Israel, but always usually known as Surah Al-Isra. And by placing the third answer in Surah Al-Isra, the divine wisdom is informing us that these two surahs are linked with each other. What were the questions and what were the answers? Some 13 or 14 years ago while I was in New York I began this book Surah al Kaf in the Modern Age and while I was working on this book 9-11 took place and I put this book aside because there was another book which was more important than this and then I wrote Jerusalem in the Quran and I'm waiting for a time to come when I can return to this book I was able to finish this book about six years ago Surah al Kaf from the modern age and together with this book a second book the word tafsir means that which explains or expounds. But the word ta'wil means that which interprets. So we did the first book which is tafsir of Surah al kahf The text, translation and commentary. And then that was the companion volume to this one, which is the Ta'wil Surah al Kaf at the modern age. But I then realized that there are two more books that have to be written. It's a quartet. And the third book will have to be on Gog and Magog, because this is the Surah. So, Alhamdulillah, about two years ago, by Allah's kindness, I was able to re, 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 uh, complete the third book, An Islamic View of Gog and Magog in the Modern World. But there's a fourth book left to complete the quartet. And I don't know whether I'd live to finish that book. <laughs> because that is the most difficult one of all. I've never encountered a subject more difficult than it. 
an Islamic view of Dajjal, the false messiah or the antichrist. Because you need more than what the Darul Ulum offers as an education. Much more than what the Darul Ulum. Much, much, much more than what Al Azhar University can offer. You need a scholarship which is multi dimensional, <laughs> a vast scholarship. You need scholarship in politics. You need scholarship in, in, in economics. You need scholarship in monetary economics. You need scholarship in international relations. You need scholarship in history. You need scholarship in the philosophy of history to be able to handle the subject of the job. Mm -hmm. Today, we look at only a small part of the subject. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam said, recite the first 10 ayat of Surah al kahf for protection from the fitna of the Dajjal. But before we turn to this, which is the substance of our lecture tonight, he also said, recite Surah al kahfi uh, for our audience outside, Surah al kahf but for Malaysia, Surah al kahfi recite Surah al kahfi on the day of Jumu'ah. I can't say Friday, why? Because Friday, the word Friday, which came out of the Vatican incidentally, is the day for the worship of Fry. And Fry is a Scandinavian goddess, so let's stay with the day of Juma. <laughs> Recite Surah Tul Kafi on the day of Juma. And you will get Noor, Noor, from the Samawat to the Ard. And remember Allah says, Allahu Nuru Samawati Wal Ard. So that which binds the Samawat with the Ard. That which allows you to transit <laughs> between the two, backward and forward movement between the different worlds of space and time. Einstein would be interested in this. It's light. No. Hmm? Recite Surah al kafi on the day of Jumu'ah. Ah. And you will get that Noor from the Samawat to the Up. And that Noor will stay with you until the next Jumu'ah. Ah. And so we do that. I'm sure in Masjid al Ghufran, I don't have to ask you to raise your hands. We recite Surah al Kafi on the day of Juma. Why do we need that Noor? There is a hadith I have to share with you. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam was asleep at the home of his wife Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha this is Medina and he saw something in his sleep a vision and it was so terrible so terrible so terrible that he woke up from the sleep with his face red this can't be normal red and then he uttered the words وَيْلٌ لِلْعَرَبِ مِنْ شَرٍ قَدْ اِكْتَرَبَ Woe unto the Arabs because of a great evil which will now come close, which is now approaching. And then he raised his hands like this and made a circle and he says, Today a hole has been made in that Radam or the barrier bit by Zulkarnain. Ya Juj and Majuj or Gog and Magog are behind. So today the release of Gog and Magog will commence. And that's bad news for the Arabs. So she asked, Yani Zainab, radiallahu ta'ala anha, Anuhlika, Anuhlika, will we be destroyed? This is not Imran speaking. No, this is a valid translation of what is in the Hadith. Anuhlika, will the Arabs be destroyed? While there are amongst us those who are righteous. And he replied, he said, Naam. Yes. And then he gave the time and the reason. 
He said, Iza kathur al khabas. When the scum prevail. Who are the scum? Who are the scum? Hmm? Who are those who are so ref referred to with such contempt? When these scum prevail, then the destruction of the Arabs will come. That destruction has not taken place as yet. Because that is a destruction connected with Gog and Magog. So it's an end time destruction. It is something still to come. And what we're going through at this moment while I am speaking is that the Arab world is being prepared for that great destruction. Who are the scum? Why are they referred to as the scum? They are the scum because they have eyes and yet cannot see. They have ears and yet cannot hear. They have hearts and yet do not understand. Allah says in the Quran of such people, Ula'ika kalanam. They're just like cattle. Bal huwa dal. Rather, they're worse than cattle. They're more misguided than cattle. Hmm? And these are the people <laughs> who now rule. These are the people who are now leaders. And these are the people who are therefore misguided and misguiding others. And so the destruction is now certain. What is it that caused them to be a people with eyes and yet cannot see? They don't have nur. Where does the nur come from? Not in the stock market. No. Allah knows in whose hearts there is sincerity. There is that fellow who says, Oh Allah, everything I give for you, but not my green card. That I can't sacrifice. Not my US passport, because that's my passport to Jannah. I can't do this because if I do this, I know this is right, but if I do this, my business will suffer. If I speak like this, I won't get a visa to travel. If I speak like this, they're going to put me on a no-fly list. If I speak like this, I'll be called a terrorist. I don't want to go down that road. You see? But when you have noor in the heart, Allah will put it there because he can see sincerity in that heart. This is the one who says, Kul, inna salati, wa nusuki, wa mahiyaya, wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. Ila akhir al ayah. Verily, my prayer and my service of sacrifice, my very living and my very dying, everything is for you. We recite Surah Al Kafi on the day of Juma to get that nur with which we can see what otherwise cannot be seen. But the first 10 verses of Surah Al Kafi must be studied. Because this is directly related to Dajjal and protection from Dajjal. In addition to reciting the whole surah on the day of Juma, let us concentrate on the first ten. The surah begins like this: Ba'adauzu billahi min al-shaytan rajim Alhamdulillah alladhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitab. Praise is due to him who has sent down on his servant, Yani Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam, the kitab. Kitab means book. Book means you have to read it. So if we don't have time to read the book, we will pay a price for that. <laughs> this is easy so far. But listen to the words which come after. وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ عِوَجًا عِوَج is now being translated mischievously so as flawless 
meaning there is no defect in this book. But that is not what the surah is saying. <laughs> the surah is saying that there is nothing crooked here. And by saying that there is nothing crooked here, it is pointing to crookedness elsewhere. We have sent down this book. Inna nahnu nazzalna zikr wa inna lahu lahafizun. And we are protecting this book so you cannot change it and make it crooked as you have done with the previous books. And so here is a clue. As big as a billboard to the airport. And you know the billboards to the airport are very big. That if you want to understand the Jal, if you want to recognize the battlegrounds on which he will attack you, go look to find the Iwaj that have corrupted the previous scriptures. When we do that, we see first of all, for example, that in this book Allah has prohibited riba. Huh? And the very last revelation to come down in the Quran is on riba. And Allah declares war. But when we go to the previous scriptures, what do we find? Allah speaks about the Iwaj in the previous scriptures. He says, for example, in Surah An-Nisa, وَأَكْلِهِمُ riba." They were consuming riba. وَقَدْ an, Even though we had prohibited it for them. So here is a direct sign now for us to go to the previous scriptures. And when we go to the Torah, or what remains of the Torah today, and this is not a disrespectful statement at all, we find that the Torah says that it is haram. I'm using language that you would understand. It is haram for an Israelite to lend money on interest to another Israelite. That's haram. Rabbi, can you tell me why? Is it because you're not supposed to rip off your own brother? <laughs> but the Torah goes on to say that it is halal, you can lend money on interest to those who are not Israelites. This is Iwaj. This is crookedness. And you better pay attention to that crookedness. Because Dajjal is going to attack you with riba. When the last age comes and you will know the last age because you will see the tall buildings. If you have not seen the tall buildings as yet, take a taxi and head for KLCC. When you see the tall buildings, you know, this is the last stage. And when the last stage comes, you know, you can expect the attack with riba. I wonder, has that attack come as yet? Can someone help me? Do we have money lenders now all over the world? Are the money lenders now with a new name? Beginning with a B? Huh? Yes? The money lender is in the, in the open. And he's lending money interest on interest everywhere. This banking system based on riba has come from the job. He is the mastermind. And when you are absorbed by it and trapped by it, you have been attacked by Dajjal and you deserve the fate because you had eyes and yet could not see. You went and you paid down on the house. 
The contractor is still building the house. He's not permitted to build that which has not, he's not permitted to sell that which has not been built. It's an invalid transaction. You can only sell that which has been built. But he's already sold that which has not been built. <laughs> uh -huh. An invalid transaction, a haram transaction. And you're paying interest on the loan. And now you come to me to help you. <laughs> this is the attack of the Dajjal. And that word awaj is the pointer. And there's also the other form of riba. We have eyes and yet cannot see that the paper that we're using as money is bogus, is fraudulent, is haram. Suppose one of the companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam were to return today and he goes to the market to sell and you pay him with this paper. What would the companion of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam do? Eh? I'm sure he's going to ask, where are the ulama? Where are the ulama? Al ulama wa rasul anbiya? That also is riba, that paper money. It's bogus, it's fraudulent, it's haram, but you would not know that until you study the subject of international monetary economics, which is not taught in the Darul Ulum. And tomorrow there's not going to be any more paper money. They don't need it anymore. As soon as some big war takes place, the US dollar will be brought down. A controlled demolition is called. And when the US dollar collapses, all the rest of the paper money will eventually disappear. And they have something else to replace it for micro transactions. But the macro transactions is already electronic money. And that is an instrument of riba. To rip you off and to take you into permanent poverty and destitution. So Indonesia didn't reach where Indonesia is today because the Indonesians are lazy. What nonsense is that? Or take another example. The prophets of Allah are the models of conduct. And what did they do in the Torah? Whoever did it had no shame. They took a prophet of Allah. A prophet of Allah. And it will be sinful to even repeat it, which is in the Torah, unless it be for purposes of knowledge. And they said that his daughters gave him alcohol to drink until he became what in US college campuses is called stone drunk. A prophet of Allah. And then one daughter slept with him so she could become pregnant. It's called incest. And then a second daughter also slept with him so she could become pregnant. It's called incest. Hmm? The prophet, Lut alayhi salam. And so, alcohol. When you see the tall buildings, the world is going to be inundated with alcohol. If you want to travel, you got to go to the airport. And when you go to the airport and you're leaving, alcohol is there to say goodbye to you. And when you arrive at the next airport, alcohol is there to welcome you. <laughs> and you go on the airline, where you have a place for salat on the airline, but there's alcohol being sold on the airline. Huh? And he said about alcohol, Nabi Muhammad is the mother of all evils. The mother of all evils. Are we living today in that age when, like riba, which has become universal, the proliferation of alcohol has become universal? Oh yes, we have. This is Iwaj. And this is Surah Al-Kahf of the Quran giving you homework to do. But it's not only alcohol. Remember the daughter sleeps with the father. So this is incest. 
So are we looking to a tomorrow when there is going to be universal incest? Brothers and sisters and mothers and sons and fathers and daughters? Or is it that that tomorrow has already arrived today? And because it is something that occurs inside the home, inside the bedroom, it cannot be monitored so easily. Huh? If we look into the scriptures to find that which is awaj or crooked, the criterion which we should use to begin our research is the Quran. Look to the Quran and use the Quran as the yardstick with which to measure that which is in previous scriptures. So when you find in the previous scriptures a different story that Musa alayhi salam went up the mountain. Which mountain? Mount Sinai. And he left Banu Israel in the charge of his brother Harun alayhi salam. And when he came back down he found Banu Israel worshipping a golden calf made of gold. I wonder why they're still doing it up to today. Huh? Not all of them of course. The Quran tells us that Musa Islam held on to Harun Islam by his ear. And Harun Islam begged him, please, please brother, don't hold on to me like this. O son of my mother, I am innocent. I am not responsible for this. It's the Samiri. He is responsible. And I fear that if I had intervened, it would have broken up the unity of the community. So he's innocent. And then Musa alayhi salam prayed to Allah for protection and forgiveness for himself and for his brother. And then took on Samiri. But when we go to the Torah, we find something else. The Torah tells us that it is Harun. He is the one responsible for uh, forging this golden calf and asking the people to worship it. This is your homework now. I have given you a few examples. Every time you find an iwaj, something that is crooked in the Torah, in the Gospel, you know in advance that Dajjal is going to use this as a battleground to attack you. And so you will be prepared and you'll be able to defend yourself. But imagine my surprise when about Two years ago, I realized, and it was astonishing for me, because these things come like a flash, that ewaj or crookedness cannot be restricted only to the previous scriptures, to the Torah and to the Injil, but that ewaj or crookedness can also infiltrate the hadith namely fabricated a hadith and if they are fabricated a hadith the Dajjal is going to use those a hadith as well to attack us so now we take a look and see how have the attacks already started? One of the reasons why the internet has come <laughs> is to facilitate this attack upon Islam 
and upon the Muslims around the world with speed, with speed, effortlessly, within hours. Mm -hmm. If you go to the internet, you'll see the signs of where the attacks are coming from. The hadith is there in Sahih Bukhari. It is there in Sahih Muslim. It is there for Muttafaqun Ali. <laughs> it is also hadith which comes from very various sources. It's also in other books of hadith. So such a hadith is universally accepted as valid. What does it say? It says that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said that Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam married me when I was six and that is absolutely false. Totally and completely and absolutely false. And it's there. It's there. Did Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam ever have a marriage ceremony to marry her? Where is the evidence? Well then what happened? It's there in the seerah. What happened was that he had a vision. What happened was that the angel came. There was a vision. And the angels were carrying a golden tray. And on the tray there was something covered with a silk cloth. This is in the seerah, this is in the hadith. And the Prophet was said, remove the cloth. This is Allah's gift to you. And when he removed the cloth, there was Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha on the tree. Indicating that Allah had ordained that this is your wife. If Allah has ordained the marriage over there, can you perform a marriage ceremony here? Huh? Is it true to say that the Prophet married her? When it is Allah who did it? Was there ever a marriage ceremony here? In a marriage ceremony, the girl has a choice. Yes. Did she have any choice? And so this hadith is false. When it says that the Prophet married her, married me when I was six. And that the marriage was consummated when I was nine. Not only are they already attacking us with this, this awaj, but the worst is yet to come. Because Tunisia just voted and the Islamic party won the elections. And Egypt is voting next month. And you can close your eyes. You can close your eyes and tell that the Islamic parties are going to win the elections. And then there's going to be a domino effect all over the Arab world. And Islamic parties are going to win all over the place. And then the cry will be to restore the Sharia. And there are ulama in Egypt who are speaking with great eloquence now for the restoration of the Sharia. When you listen to them on the internet, the chairs will fall from your eyes with such eloquence. And once they say we, we have enforced the Sharia, then Dajjal will attack. And a fa family will come before the Sharia court in Egypt with a daughter who is six and with a man who is 55 for a nikah. And Al Jazeera will be there, and CNN will be there, and the New York Times will be there, and the Washington Post will be there, and the London Times will be there, and the Sharia court will have to rule. Is it jais? If this hadith is valid, then it is jais. Okay? And if this hadith is false, it is fabricated, it is not jais. If you have eyes and yet cannot see, you will not recognize that it is fabricated. And all indications are that they will say it is jais. 
And when that marriage ceremony takes place, Muslims around the world are going to be searching for a place to hide their faces because the shame and the disgrace will be so great. People are going to be laughing at us. Is this your religion? Every pedophile in Australia will want to become a Muslim now. And so we end. Surah Al-Kahf of the Quran and the Messenger of Allah says recite the first ten ayat. We've taken only one out of the ten. You have homework to do. This book attempts to look at the first ten ayat of Surah Al-Kahf of the Quran. We pray that we will wake up now and return to Surah Al-Kahf and study it, not just recite it. So we can understand the world today and anticipate the attacks tomorrow. Rabbana taqabal minna inna ka inta samiul alim wa tawa alayna ya maulana inna ka inta tawab rahim bi rahmatika ya rahma rahim. Ameen. Okay. The restoration of the Sharia is something for which every Muslim must long, long for in his heart. It should never depart from the heart. A world in which the Sharia is not in force is something munkar. And the, the Prophet said, when you see that which is munkar, then change it with your hand. And if you cannot, then with your tongue. And if you cannot, then with your heart. But if in the heart there is no desire, no longing to bring back the Sharia, then all is lost. All is lost. The Sharia cannot be restored within the embrace of the modern secular state. Not possible. The modern secular state has taken away sovereignty from Allah and placed that sovereignty in the state. That came from Dajjal. That is shirk. And when you go and vote in the elections, you now become a part of that shirk. So those who want to go and vote, go ahead. But when you have to answer on the Day of Judgment, don't say you didn't know. Give all the arguments you want on Judgment Day. But I am not going to go and vote. No. Not in an election in a secular state. Rather, the Sharia requires the restoration of the Khilafah. And you can't restore the Khilafah by taking the Islamic movement and transforming it into a political party and then fighting in elections and forming alliances with Tom, Dick and Harry and you expect you're going to bring back the Khilafah that way? No, that's not possible. Until such time as we can restore the Khilafah and Darul Islam and knowledge has disappeared to such an extent today there is such widespread ignorance in the world of Islam today that hardly anyone knows what is Darul Islam today. Hmm? You know what it is to be a Malaysian citizen and an Egyptian citizen and you have no problems at all in applying for a visa to perform the Hajj. But if one of the companions of the Prophet would have come back today, would he go to a Saudi consulate to apply for a visa to perform the Hajj? That is a pathetic state of ignorance of the subject today. Nobody knows the subject. Until such time as we can restore the Khilafah, how do we deal with the subject of Sharia? The answer is, if you cannot restore Sharia at the macro level, then at least restore it at the micro level. Allah does not call upon you for that which lies beyond your capacity. Hmm? 
ittakullaha mastata'atum he says in suratul taghabun fear Allah to the extent that you have capacity to do so and so try to restore the sharia at the micro level there's an imam in eastern parkway in Brooklyn in New York African American tall like a coconut tree powerful man Imam Ibrahim and the African American people if they commit zina they have no problems in going to the Imam and say Imam I committed zina yeah they're not like us they have that sincerity in their hearts so they confess I committed zina so the Imam will roll up his sleeve I'm talking about New York eh? and two of his officers two of his men will bring you into the masjid and he roll up his sleeve and he give you a beating in the masjid <laughs> you think Uncle Sam has ever done anything to stop him <laughs> no no who has fear of Allah in your heart Allah will open a way for you so we have said until such time as the Khilafah is restored and the Sharia is restored you can't restore Sharia and still remain a member of the United Nations organization what nonsense is that you can't have Sharia and you're still a member of the International Monetary Fund which prohibits the use of gold as money Dr. Mahathir did not know that what nonsense is that how can you restore Sharia <laughs> when you're un under the obligation of all those resolutions of the United Nations which bind you and tie you all around hmm? until such time as we can restore Khilafah which in my opinion is Imam al-Mahdi until that time what we do is withdraw to the countryside to Kampung and there build micro-Islam and enforce Sharia to the extent that we have capacity to do so. Number two, there's a difference between signs of the last day which pertain to the Sa'a in which the sign of all signs is not that the mountains are going to be flying like pieces of cotton wool and the graves are going to open out <laughs> no there is a sa'a which comes before that that is the end of the world and at that time when the world is to end before that happens Allah will send like a gas out of the sky and whoever has even a grain of a mustard seed of faith in the heart and inhales that gas will die so the last hour will not come on anyone who says Allah 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 with his heart but if you see the Sheikh after the gas has come and he's there with his big hat and he's giving very eloquent lectures on Surah to the Kath. We still alive? Implication? It's just words. <laughs> it's just words. He does not have even a grain of a mustard seed of faith in his heart. The last hour will come on such people. But before that last hour comes, there's another last hour and in this last hour there is the triumph of truth over all rivals and at the heart of that last hour I call this the end of history and I call that the end of the world at the heart of this alama to sa'a is wa innahu the Quran says la ain lam mim and this ain lam mim can be read two ways 
It could be wa innahu la ilmul lisaa, the knowledge of the hour. Surely he is the knowledge of the hour. He being Nabi Isa alayhi salam. That's the context of the passage. But it can also be pronounced differently. Wa innahu la alamun lisaa, and surely he is the sign of the last hour. The sign of all signs is the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. When he comes back at that time, yes, there will be believers left in the world. And uh, most of them are going to be in the Holy Land. Which indicates that probably the American continent will probably be bare. No human beings left in the American continent. Europe, bare, no human beings there. I, of course, can be wrong. I've made mistakes in the past. But all the indicators are that we are moving in the direction of nuclear warfare between the two contending powers. On one side is Russia and China, and on the other side is the Anglo-American Israeli alliance. And if that nuclear war takes place, it's going to be thousands of nuclear weapons. Every nuclear weapon that explodes produces a mushroom cloud. So if thousands of nuclear weapons explode, that's Dukhan, that's the smoke. It's going to incinerate every city. Is there anything in the Quran that tells us something about this? It is in Surah Al-Isra, if I can remember the ayah now. I can't remember the ayah, I'm too tired. But in Surah Al-Isra, Allah says, that he's going to destroy every town and every city. And those which escape destruction will be punished with terrible punishment. Maybe I'll remember the ayah before we end. Hmm? So there is something in the Quran which confirms this universal destruction of all towns and all cities. And I think that the electronic waves with which you are able to use this thing called the cell phone and the wireless internet will also transmit that which will incinerate us. Incinerate means to burn you, to become ashes when that nuclear warfare takes place. And the only people who will escape will be those who follow the example of the young men of Surah al -Kaf. Who fled? Who fled? Who withdrew from society and went to the cave? And we want to do the same thing, but to withdraw to the remote countryside. We know that we in Kampung when we cannot use a cell phone. Next question. Now you mentioned your speech intervention of Al Jazeera, you mentioned about CNN, then you mentioned about the uh, difficulty in obtaining the uh, visas and and the and making finances and so on and so on. Now excuse me. The happening in the Arab world, the upheaval now, how does it come in from? Is it from the infiltration of the Western agents mm. or because of the failure of the government of Islamic government in the states of, of uh, Arab world. Mm. Now, which okay. is the right thing? Okay. Yeah. I gave a lecture on this subject with Jamaluddin here. Jamaluddin organized that lecture in April at the University of Malaya and the lecture is on the internet. An Islamic view 
of the current Arab uprising. So is that the topic? Yeah. So please listen to that lecture. I also have an essay on my website on the same subject. An Islamic view of the current Arab uprisings. Our analysis is that while we commend those who rise up against oppression and seek to extricate themselves from oppression and who hate the oppressor, hmm? that what is now happening in the Arab world also has an agenda that lies behind this. If you deny the rain from falling for long enough, the land will become parched and dry. And just one matchstick is all you need to create a conflagration that will burn down thousands and thousands of acres of land. One matchstick. That's what they did. The banking system in particular. The monetary system in particular. And not only that, but they're the ones who put these dictators there and they kept them there. And they forced the dictators to act brutally towards their own people. Hmm? They did that for long enough to ensure that the land becomes parched and dry and the people are groaning to oppression and they're longing to get out. And then they came with the match. And when they lit the match, of course the whole thing blew up. But they are the ones who plan the timing. The Arab uprisings are taking place now for a particular reason. It's not happening in a vacuum. It's happening because of a particular reason. We have reached that moment in time. My book Jerusalem in the Quran explains the subject. When stage two of Dajjal's mission is coming to an end. And phase three is commencing. In phase one of the Jazz mission, the world experienced Pax Britannica, with Britain as a ruling state. In phase two of the Jazz mission, the world experienced Pax Americana, with United States of America as a ruling state. We say these things are not happening by accident. If this can be by accident, a cow can also jump over the moon. No, there's a reason why Pax Americana replaced Pax Britannica. And now we say Pax Judaica, meaning a Jewish world order, Israel ruling the world. Pax Judaica wants to replace Pax Americana. In order for Pax Judaica to replace Pax Americana, what we have to do is look to see what happened the first time. In order for Pax Americana to replace Pax Britannica, what happened? Study that. And when you study that, you'll realize that money is one of the key. One of the keys to the transition, money. And so the US dollar will have to collapse. The US dollar is not collapsing on its own to any economic reasons. It is a controlled demolition job by the Zionists. They know what they're doing. And they have the Federal Reserve in their control. Not the American people. <laughs> and so 15 years ago, Imran Hussein is not a prophet. Imran Hussein doesn't have an angel or a jinn whispering in his ears. Now how could Imran Hussein say 15 years ago that the US dollar must collapse? Which I did. It's there. It's documented. Nobody else said that. No monetary economist in the world said that. But I said it. Why? Because I had Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam. We have him as our teacher. Huh? So my study of Islamic eschatology led me to the conclusion, studying Dajjal, led me to the conclusion 
that the US dollar is not only going to collapse but must collapse in order for Israel to take over from the United States. That when the US dollar collapses it's going to bring down all the paper money in the world because they don't need paper money anymore. And then the electronic money will take over. Hmm? So now we are witnessing this. This is the moment that I anticipated 15 years ago. The US dollar is already finished, it's just waiting now to, to collapse, to be finished and to be demonetized. But not only must you have a fundamental change of power in money, but there was something else that happened between phase one and phase two. And that is that the United States had to intervene to save Britain from defeat in the First World War. Britain was on the verge of defeat. The German submarines had marooned Britain. Britain probably had food for two weeks left. When the plan was worked out, they went to the British government and said, you're losing the war, but we can help you to win it. And that's when the British issued the Balfour Declaration, <laughs> that it is the intention of the British government to work for the establishment of a Jewish national home in the Holy Land in November 1917. That was the quid pro quo for them to bring the United States into the war. And once the United States entered the war, the First World War, Britain, Germany was defeated. Okay? And so, not only did the United States have to wage big wars, but also United States had to intervene to save Britain for defeat. And so it was clear to the whole world, Britain is no longer the ruling state. The United States has taken over. We can therefore close our eyes and anticipate that Israel is going to wage big wars. But more than that, that the United States has to be set, set a trap for the United States. Where the US, the US is facing military defeat. And if Israel does not intervene, that's it for Uncle Sam. And then Israel will intervene, like the United States intervened in the First World War. And then it will be clear to the world who is now the ruling state in the world. The Arab uprisings are meant to prepare the way for all these things to happen. I mentioned the destruction of the Arabs, the Hadith. The Arab uprisings are preparing the Arabs for the great slaughter. But it is part of the divine scheme that Allah chose them. Allah chose them that they would be the ones who would suffer, not the Malay. No, not the Malay. The Malay can eat his roti chanai and go home and sleep. Oh yeah, the Arabs will weep. The Arabs will suffer. Terrible suffering. They have not suffered as yet as much as what is going to come. And that's part of the divine plan we have to say to the Arabs that comfort their hearts. That you must be something special to Allah that Allah should choose you. That you have to be sacrificed so that Allah's plan can take place. And eventually they'll be punished with the greatest punishment. What is that trap for the United States? To lead the United States to a situation where military defeat. It could be that, ah, of course I can be wrong. Remember that, I can be wrong. It could be that Israel is going to attack Iran. And when Israel attacks Iran, of course Iran is going to retaliate. But Iran is given the green light, so to say, as Saddam Hussein was given the green light to take Kuwait. So Iran is given the green light to take Bahrain. And Iran occupies Bahrain, which is majority Shia. And the Shia population of Bahrain will welcome Iran. 
Why should they not? They're being oppressed. Once Iran occupies Bahrain, Iran is heading for Saudi Arabia. <laughs> and the Saudis know how to drive BMWs. I don't think they know how to drive to, to fight Iran. Huh? So Saudi Arabia is going to call on the United States, its patron, to intervene. And if the United States makes that mistake to enter into Saudi Arabia, to fight Iran, that could be the graveyard. That could be the place where the United States can be facing defeat. And if the United States is facing defeat in the desert, the only force in the world that can intervene to save them from defeat is Israel. Israel. This is a possible scenario. But do remember, I can be wrong. Next question. Salam Salam uh, Pardon me for asking this question. Uh, can you explain in very simple terms the meaning of young Jews and my Jews as if to a layman and Karamoji? Can you give me one hour? Yeah, Juj and Ma'juj, in English, Gog and Magog, are explained in a hadith in Sahih Muslim, which is a hadith al Qudsi, meaning the direct speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says about them, I have created creatures of mine so powerful that none but I can destroy them. These who have been ordained with this literally indestructible power are human beings. Not some strange creatures living in the bowel of the earth. They're human beings. The Prophet said that they are from Banu Adam. They're Banu Adam. But the Quran tells us that they use their power to oppress. Whereas Zul Karnain uses his power to punish the oppressor. Surah to Kef. Gog and Magog commit facade. Facade is that which corrupts and destroys. The Quran gives us many different forms of facade. For example, it speaks about the corruption of agriculture, food, as facade. And that's what's happening today. Genetically modified food may provide nutrition but would not function medicinally because the genetic combination that Allah gave to it has been altered. So then where is the immune system going to get its, uh, its nourishment from? Are we going to have to go to the pharmacy around the corner <laughs> to get medicine for our immune system when Allah has provided it in food. So the tampering with the genetic composition of food destroys the capacity of food to function medicinally, which is facade. And so as we eat this supermarket food, I'm not talking about kampoon food, supermarket food, you notice around the world the immune system going weaker and weaker and so the antibiotics prescribed by the doctors have to become stronger and stronger this corruption and destruction of food is Gog and Magog um, the people who met with Zulkarnain and complained to him about Gog and Magog when their wickedness asked him could he build a barrier 
to protect them. And he built it with blocks of iron and then covered the blocks of iron with molten copper. Hmm? We actually know where that barrier was built. My book on Gog and Magog outside gives you the analysis by which you can recognize the exact geographical location. So Gog and Magog are from behind that barrier. We also know when the barrier was brought down. I quoted the hadith, today a hole has been made in the wall. When Gog and Magog are released, then the world is going to witness an indestructible power taking control of the world. But it's going to be a wicked power. When we go to Suratul Anbiya of the Quran, we get a second reference to Gog and Magog. That Allah speaks of a town which he destroyed and the people of the town were expelled from the town and then a ban was placed upon them that they could never return to reclaim that town as their own. They can come back as tourists <laughs> but they cannot come back to reclaim the town as their own. Until? Until when? Until two things happen. Number one, Gog and Magog are released. And number two, Gog and Magog spread out in all directions and therefore take control of the world. Power in the world is there. They are the world order. At that time, the people of the town will return to reclaim the town as their own. Which town is it? I gave the answer. It's Jerusalem. It's Jerusalem. And I gave the reasons why I came to that conclusion. That's my book outside Jerusalem in the Quran. And so when you see the Jews returning to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem, to reclaim it as their own, you know, Gog and Magog have brought them back. One more hadith and I'll end. Hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. People will continue to perform the Hajj and also the Umrah. Even after Gog and Magog have been released, the Hajj and the Umrah will still continue. But then the hadith goes on to say, لا تقوم الساعة حتى لا يحج. That the last hour will not come until the Hajj is abandoned. If Israel attacks Iran, goodbye to the Hajj. If Israel attacks Iran, goodbye to the Hajj. When the Hajj no longer takes place, how can you say Gog and Magog have not been released? Sorry for the long answer. Any more questions or shall we call it a night?